Hello there. Welcome to the Digital Lost. This is Pamela's new workout, and you are watching part two of my shallow dive tutorial. This video will be quite a bit different from the part one. Uh, there'll be no sweeping glamour shots of the module. There'll be none of my charming talking head. Uh, this is more of a supplementary video, just a follow-up. We just look at a few things that I maybe skipped over in the first video or things that people have asked me about since that first video came out. If you are unfamiliar with the module, maybe go back and watch that first video before you watch this one. This will make a whole lot more sense uh, if you have seen that first video. I will link it below. And as with the first video, this tutorial is not one that makes demands on how you have to use this module, more it shows you what it can do and hopefully uh, tries to take away uh, some of the fear and mystery about this module because it can look quite daunting. It does a lot, but it's so simple, it's so well laid out and the main lesson of the first video was uh, the worst thing you can do with this module is to overthink it. Um, so yeah, those same rules apply on this one. So what exactly are we looking at in this video? Well, let's put up a time index and we'll go over it. First of all, we will be looking at the top inputs. Uh, they're loosely banked into two. Uh, we'll start with the clock and the run input. And we'll run some different sequences through there. And then we'll look at CV1 and CV2 input and exactly what they are for. We'll have a look at phase and what on earth that is. We'll then look at R skip, which is just an option to completely skip notes, and we'll look at how that works. Up next are the ever popular Euclidean rhythms. We'll just see how Pamela's handled those. Uh, and then we'll have a look at slop, uh, which is a bit strange, but it's a really welcome, uh, welcome addition. So, Let's start looking at the top jacks. Of course, in the first video, we just focused on these outputs. We have these four input jacks up the top. Clock, run, CV1, and CV2. Let's start with clock and run. These allow you to connect external sequences, which can send either their own clock signal or a run signal, which tells Pamela's to start and stop. Uh, it can do CV or MIDI. We're going to look at MIDI mostly. Uh, so let's grab ourselves a MIDI sequencer. Like this. The Novation Launchpad Pro Mark III. Why are we using this sequencer? Because it's the one that I own and use daily. The sequencer itself does not plug directly into Pamela's new workout. Uh, we need to do that via this module here. There might be other modules that can do the same thing, but this is what I have, as it is also made by ALM, and it works exactly uh, for what I need it for. Uh, as we can see, we have volt per octave output, velocity output, and a gate output. These aren't really going to affect what we're doing with Pamela's new workout at all. What will affect things, though, is this section here, clock. We have X24 and we have run. Up here on Pamela's, you can see we have a clock input and a run input. Clock, clock, run, run. The X24 merely refers to the uh, PPQN or the parts per quarter note, which is just a way, like a rating, I guess, uh, a standard that these devices might so-called talk to each other to uh, flow and sort of click on the same clock, if that makes sense. All of that can be changed. It will depend on your sequencer. But because my launch pad is connected via this model through a 5-pin DIN MIDI, goes through the adapter here, uh, that is pretty much at a standard 24 ppqn so we are good to go so launchpad is connected to this module we have 
x24, which is our clock output. So, let's plug in. Let's plug that into clock. And you can see both are currently on 120. But once we've connected this, Pamela's is now slaved to the Launchpad Pro here. Let's also connect the run. Now what this will do for us is, should we have a sequence set up on here, when we press the play button, it will start cycling Pamela's. So if we had a big sequence going, we could just hit play and this would also start in time with the, uh, the, sl the master clock coming from the Novation launchpad. Let me show you what I mean. For this, we're going to go with a, uh, a trusty drum beat. Get used to hearing the drum beat because it's an excellent way of uh, demonstrating what I'm talking about. So let's just go from output one. And let's go into our clone of Peaks, which serves many purposes, but one of them is a very basic but serviceable drum machine. Trigger one is a bass drum. So, oh, wake up. All right, so as we can see, 120, 120. When I press play on here, you'll notice these will start flashing, which means this is controlling this stops, uh, start stop button. So let's go. Stop, and it stops. Let's start that again, and we can start playing with the tempo on the launch pad, and you'll watch this number change with this one, all being controlled from the launch pad. And as you can see, as this number goes down, as does the number, the BPM, on Pamela's. So that is the clock and run inputs. What about these two here, CV1 and CV2? Again, also inputs, of course. Um, these allow you to take a CV signal from an external device, or even Pamela's itself. Let's, <laughs> all right. for instance, let's go into output one and the options. Now we cycle through the waves, you can see it goes through square, or a gate I guess, triangle, sign, envelope, random, sign random, and then you can see here it's changed to CV1. At this point, if I were to select that, it means that instead of the internal clock, Pamela's will be looking for, well, I shouldn't say internal clock, because again, you can actually use one of the outputs in there, but it's looking for a signal from the CV1 input to dictate the speed or the pattern that it will operate at. Let's look at what I'm talking about. That's going to be a lot easier. There is a CV2. They do much the same thing, but CV2 also handles negative voltages as well. So we'll just look at CV1. So we have output one is looking for a signal from input one. So we're going to use Pamela's itself to send a signal. Let's use four. Now, we'll go back to the home screen, and if you've seen the first video or if you're familiar with this, you know exactly what's going on here. We scroll over to output four, hold down the encoder. We're at the wave selection. We're gonna hold it down again. No, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna just press it once. Let's go to random. So we select random. Now, when I press start stop, you will see or LED, start flickering at the random pulse rate that it's going at. Now when we press start stop, you should see 
channel 4 flickering at its random rate, channel 1 should mirror that random rate as well. All these other outputs, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8, should all start flashing an output at that uh, internal clocked 120 BPM. Let's have a look. Now, as you can see, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all flashing at 120 BPM because that is the clock that they are accepting, whereas channel 1 is accepting clock from CB1, which is being fed a random signal from output 4. And why would you want to do that? Well, there are a number of reasons. It's nothing that I particularly use, but say you wanted to send an identical random signal to multiple sources. This is a perfect way to do that. So, for instance, output 2 on the Peaks clone is a snare drum. So, let's go output 2 to channel 2 on Peaks. Now, right now, output 1, which is being fed the random voltage from 4, is still going at that random. 2, we just have assigned to the internal 120 BPM, so that is just going dick, 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 at 120. So let's change that to accept the signal from CV1 as well. We're on CV1, select. Now suddenly, channel 2 here is also going at that same random rate that CV1 is feeding it. So CV, output 4 I should say, is feeding CV1, a random signal. Now 1 and 2 are mirroring each other, they're all going at that same random rate. Let's add another one, just for fun. Let's go from three. Let's go into plats here. You might notice from the first video that I have a legitimate plats module now as well, rather than the miniature clone. That miniature clone was very difficult to use with its tiny little knobs. And there were one or two other issues with it, and I got a legit uh, plats module, and I absolutely love it. But anyway, uh, on plats, we are on the bass drum sound. Let's go out and let's go in. Now, as you can hear, because we haven't changed input uh, output three yet, that is still at the 120. So let's change that to CV1 as well. three of these are being fed an identical random signal from four connected to CV input one. Again, if you would find use for this, great, that's up to you. Um, it's nothing that I particularly used, but these are here. It's handy that they are here. And if you have other ways that you would use this, please mention down below. This isn't just my video, I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a running document that might help other people figure out how to use this really, really awesome module. So next, let's look at phase. We still have uh, everything generally plugged in as it was. All the settings are still at the random and CV inputs here, so if you remember from the first video, if we want to reset everything just back to a default state. We're on the 120 BPM home screen, so we hold down the encoder button, which gives us our options. We can just scroll to reset, press once, turn so it says OK, and that has reset everything back to a default setting. So phase will put, well, outputs out of phase with one another. Again, this is something that you could use for percussion. As always, this is not a sequencer, but it can do that rudimentary sort of boom, chit, boom, chit, uh, and we use phase for that. So 
let's we're still on 120 bpm we're still plugged into the peaks clone so let's just press start stop and you can hear that the bass drum and the snare drum are all beating at the same time but what if you, you wanted to offset one of those beats well let's have a look so we would rotate we're going to leave output one the bass drum exactly where it is we want to try to offset or send out of phase output two the snare drum so we're on output two, hold down encoder. We're gonna turn, we're gonna to go to phase. You'll see, zero percent. So it is perfectly in phase with the internal clock and output one. Press once. Now, when we start turning this, you'll hear that snare drum just start to go a little bit out of phase. at 25%, so it's say a quarter, I guess you could say, out. Let's go to 50%, that'll be the most obvious. And again, not a sequencer, but you can use this to get some sort of pretty simple boom tit boom tit rhythms going. And how useful that is to you? Well, that is up to you, again. Take what we're looking at here, apply it to your own workflow. Let's keep this going. Let's look at R skip. So, R skip, as it's called, the higher you, right, the more you raise the percentage is the higher likelihood that an entire note, well not, I shouldn't say note, that an entire hit will be skipped entirely. So. Let's start turning this up, and slowly, as we get higher, you'll hear random snare drums just missing. And again, this is just a simple way to add a little bit of randomness, something unexpected, almost a human factor. Uh, you never know when it's going to come. Again, the higher we go, the higher the likelihood that an entire pulse or hit or beat will be skipped. And here we're at a 50-50 shot of this missing a, a step entirely. Let's bring it down to 25% because why not? And already it's a very robotic beat right now uh, we have added a little bit of unexpected element to this with the skipped snare drum here and there what else can we do well let's look at Euclidean rhythms people get very excited about Euclidean rhythms and I guess I get that it's a bit different certainly um, so the whole idea is you take a certain amount of steps and then you tell the module here uh, how many times you want to hit within those steps. So, E step, this is the screen where you would enter. You would tell the module how many steps we're working with. Let's go with eight. Turn it once more, E trigger. This is how many times we will trigger a note or a hit. Yeah, so enter. Just to make it obvious, let's go with an odd number. Five. So within eight notes, we'll be triggering this snare drum five times. And because it's an odd number, it's going to just be, yeah, it'll sound a little bit off, but in a still rhythmic and musical way. And again, this is a little bit of that sort of unexpected human factor that we're adding to a very simple two note beat. But what else can we do? Well, that's when we come into slop. And we're still on the snare drum here. So slop 
is the most human-like uh, parameter that we can change currently on Pamela's. Slop literally adds sloppiness to how beats are being triggered. So the higher we turn this up, the more completely out of time the snare drum will get. higher and higher and this snare drum is getting more and more drunk. Sort of anything higher than say like 10-15% it just becomes almost unusable but that's the joy. You might not need to use it but it's nice to know that the option is there. Let's go all the way to 100. We're sort of at a point where it's almost back in time. And this is a time where you could, again, put a signal into CV1 because CV1 and CV2 as an input is an option on basically every parameter on this module. Let's just put slop up to just Go with 8%. Sometimes you just need to roll with these things and stop where you feel it's good. And as we can hear, Channel 1 is still just outputting that perfectly timed 120 BPM bass drum. The channel, or oh, output 2, playing the snare drum, that's getting a little bit all over the place. We've got randomness, we have the Euclidean rhythms doing their thing, we have a little bit of slop. We're missing the occasional uh, trigger as well. So this was part two of my Pamela's new workout shallow dive tutorial. Uh, will there be a part three? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, let me know if there's any interest in what we might want to look at in that one. We're only really left with some of the less human, more machine-like parameters like loops and logic. Uh, but certainly let me know below uh, what you might want to see in a part three. Regarding this video and the module in general, if you do have any questions, Again, go ahead below. I am no expert. I am just a very keen enthusiast, uh, but I'll do what I can to answer. I'm really very responsive in the comments, and I just love talking about this stuff. Uh, if you found the video helpful, please definitely give a thumbs up. It will make it a lot easier for other people to find the video. 
uh, and it's always really appreciated. Uh, while you're here, look at some more of my other videos. Uh, there's some cheap gear reviews, plenty of music. If you're still enjoying what you're seeing, please subscribe. It's really appreciated and it just makes uh, smaller creators like myself and others just a bit more visible in this sea of really very professional, like high-end uh, music producer videos that we just seem to be getting hit a lot with. Don't get me wrong, I really like those videos too, but it's sometimes nice to just see regular, uh, non-paid people who are just keen enthusiasts doing their thing. Um, eh, but whatever, I'm just really glad you joined me, check for more videos, and yeah, I hope to see you again. Cheers.